Our final discussion of the day is, is between Reed Hoffman and DJ Patil, and it will be moderated by Professor Amy Ziegert here at Stanford. Amy's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and also a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute. And from 2013 to 2018, Amy served as the co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation, where she founded the Stanford Cyber Policy Program, which was recently elevated to become the Stanford Cyber Policy Center. Amy's research covers intelligence and foreign policy, drone warfare, and political risk. Would you please join me in welcoming Amy Ziegert? Thanks, Rob. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the plenary session. So I have the great pleasure of introducing two men who need no introduction. It's always a great role to have. Um, Reed Hoffman, I'm just going to be very brief since you all know these two gentlemen, I'm sure, quite well. And we're very lucky that they're two of the most thoughtful people who have been working both in the policy world uh, and in the private sector. So Reed, uh, the New York Times has called him the startup whisperer. He holds many titles, partner at a venture capital firm called Greylock, investor in some of tech's biggest name companies, including Facebook and Airbnb. He's the host of a podcast called Masters at Scale. He's the co-founder and uh, CEO, uh, former CEO of LinkedIn, which was acquired by Microsoft. He serves, of course, on a number of company boards, uh, including Airbnb and Microsoft, and most importantly, on the board of HAI, which we're very <laughs> delighted about. He is also, of course, because he's such an underachiever, a best-selling author. Uh, his latest book, Blitzscaling, uh, is based on a course he taught here at Stanford about how to rapidly scale startups. He is a graduate of Stanford with a degree in symbolic systems and was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford where he got his master's degree in philosophy. And he once wrote, which I I'm sure he remembers, and I think it captures his, why he's been so visionary, it is said when architects walk through an office, they see ceiling ornamentation, light sources, building acoustics. When psychologists walk through an office, they see unresolved father issues and avoiding <laughs> personality disorders. When I walk through an office, I see networks. And he said, I know that makes me sound like the kid from the sixth sense, but I, see, I don't see dead people, I see networks. <laughs> with, uh, with us today is also DJ Patel. Uh, Forbes has called him one of the seven most powerful data scientists in the world. He helped coin the term data scientist. You know you're somebody important when you coin a new term. Um, in a 2012 Harvard Business Review author, uh, co-written by DJ, uh, it described the role of data science, scientist this way. A hybrid of data hacker, analyst, communicator, and trusted advisor, and I add, he wrote this, the sexiest job of the 21st century. So let me just say I'm a little disappointed because I thought political science professor was the sexiest <laughs> job of the 21st century. Apparently I was sorely mistaken. Uh, DJ was appointed by President Obama as the White House's first chief data scientist, where he was instrumental in helping the US government maximize its investments uh, in big data and advise on a, on a host of important policy issues. Earlier, he worked for the Defense Department using social network analysis and other new tools to predict threats. And he's also had a long uh, and successful career in the private sector, uh, working uh, with Reid Hoffman at LinkedIn. He's worked at PayPal and Skype, uh, and he was data scientist in residence at Greylock. He, too, has recently co-authored a book uh, called Ethics and Data Science, which you can download for free, and it's very uh, readable as well, about how data can be used appropriately and how to prevent its misuse. He currently serves as the head of technology for Devoted Health. He has a BA in math from UC San Diego and a PhD in applied math from the University of Maryland. So please just join me in welcoming DJ and Reed. So, DJ, I want to start with you. Can you explain what the difference is between AI and data science? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, the, the interesting question, and like, why, why, why do I say no? It, it's, it's, there's this interesting arc where I find ourselves getting twisted up trying to define things when the rest of the world doesn't care. Like, you know, the, the real measure of why, it, it, actually, let me step back and say, 
maybe I should just tell a quick story of how data scientists, the term came about. You know, we were at LinkedIn and there was this big investment, Reed really spearheaded that, of, of saying like, we should be able to do a lot more with data. And we'd seen kind of the, the, the arc of technology starting to move to being cloud computing, new algorithms, all sorts of stuff being able to happen. And whether you called it machine learning or AI or just charts and graphs, nobody else cared except that it was starting to deliver value in new products, new ways of understanding how to make decisions faster and just frankly execute faster. And one of the things that happened was Jeff Hammerbacher and I would get together and we'd regularly trade notes and he was running data at Facebook and we were heading up towards the IPO and we literally said, hey, what should we, what do you call each other? Like, what do you call the people on your team? Because HR is breathing down my neck that we've got too many different titles like statistician, uh, research scientist. And so we kind of went through the whole thing. And when we did that, we realized like research scientist sounded too academic, uh, analyst sounded too Wall Street, statistician would piss off all the economists. Economists would, you know, it makes everyone grumpy. Uh, and, and so that we, we were left with nothing else. So we were left with this idea of data scientist. And it's just, so what we did is we actually took all the job postings that we had on LinkedIn and we tested all of them. We put them all out there and we saw who applied to the, the ones and who got hired. And everyone we hired was from the data scientist ones. Now, a lot of them were using different forms of machine learning to actually make the things happen. But the reason I think the title has stuck is because when you walk into a room and you're like, oh, I'm the data person, or I'm the analyst, or those types, people get confused. Now, if you say you're the data scientist, or you're an AI, people go, oh, great, you're here. And, and that, like, <laughs> it, it's this funny thing. If you were like, I'm in BI, people would be like, who let you in? Uh, and, That's and business intelligence. The business intelligence, right? For, and so this is the part that I think we actually have to really separate and say, don't worry about what we call it. It's what we do with data and how do we actually make something happen with it that's the more important thing. So we've talked a lot and I know, I know you've been watching the um, panels earlier in the day and we've talked a lot in the panels about ethics and how we think about ethics and AI. So Reed, can you talk about when you're thinking of investing in a company, mm. how do you think about the, uh, the company leaders and their ethical, how do you gauge what their ethical north stars could be? What role does ethics play in your investment decision? So ideally, um, the companies that I and my partners Greylock like to invest in are ones that put the mission first. And the mission is in part for customers and consumers, but is also in part for that you wanna be proud that that uh, organization, that product, that service, the world's better for it. For being there, so that first you're looking at the business model and kind of what what you're what you're uh, d building to deploy. So you're you know positive on things like you know LinkedIn and Airbnb. Uh, you're you know uh, not taking the meeting if it's Jewel, <laughs> right? You know, for example, as as kind of just just ways of, of of parsing. And that's only looking at first the business model. And then the second question comes when you're looking at an entrepreneur is what are the what are the conditions in which the entrepreneur is willing to fail, right? So what, what are the things where you say, okay, I didn't succeed? And obviously, in a very broad way, you want a lot of energy, you want a lot of, of, of willingness to really push hard because these startup companies are very difficult to do. But some of that is you want to say, well, I'll fail rather than do something that's very detrimental or bad for society, for people, and so forth. And that part of what you're looking for is, is the sense of, uh, I am trying as best I can to build a new thing that when, I, when we've done it, all of the employees, all of the uh, people around it can go to people who are not involved with it and say, this is why this is a good thing. This is why it's good for individuals, good for consumers, good for society. Now, you know, frequently when you think about uh, questions around ethics, you say, well, what does that mean for kind of an ethical compass? And by the way, this can range you can have an ethical compass that goes everything from, you know, I'm deeply progressive and I think that we should live in a greater society to actually, in fact, I'm fairly libertarian. That whole range still fits within this compass of, okay, I am trying to do something such that once we succeed, uh, the society is in a much better place, the network of consumers is in a much better place, and in, in going that, I'm not doing anything that 
that, that causes major risks or major harms. And so we, you two work closely together at LinkedIn. Can you share some of the, and sometimes the profit decision goes in one direction and the values decision is in tension with that. Can you talk through some of the big challenges you two face together and how you reason through them? Yeah, maybe we should talk about the, the, the people asking for the data set. Yes. Yeah, so, so maybe I'll just <laughs> set it up. Is, it, 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 this is something I don't think people always see is that, you know, at least when we were working together on LinkedIn is you were faced with ethical decisions all the time. Uh, when, when using data. And, and the first premise is, whose data is it? How do you view it? How do you think about these things? One of the ones that we'd get the questions on was from hedge fund companies calling up and saying, hey, would you be willing to sell us your, the database, basically, all the data of LinkedIn to understand, could we get a predictive uh, lead on you know, what companies are going to do well or which ones aren't going to do well based on you know, people changing jobs? And one of the things that I always took away from it is that, and what was critical is, I had to take a lots of philosophy in my undergraduate, and so I had to I had to read lots of Karl Popper and everything else, and read obviously knows way more on philosophy than than I did, but we were able to move through those decisions very effectively because we had common language, and I think one of the the big lessons that I took away from that experience was that if you don't have ethics and a lot of the liberal arts as part of the core training in, in part of your undergraduate cur curriculum, it, you're at a disadvantage for dealing with these, these, these aspects. But I found like we, were, we had long, hard, yep. dis it wasn't like we just willy-nilly did. It was actually very yeah. hard discussions. Yeah, there are, and there, there are easy decisions and then there are complex mm -hmm. decisions. And DJ's <clears throat> statement about having a Shared language uh, is really good. You know, for, unfortunately, as you grow a company, uh, the ability to maintain a shared language that comes in is hard, so you're frequently building one. Um, but you'd also kind of use a set of tests, because a lot of what you do when you're building a company, because you don't want to give away your uh, competitive secrets uh, to competitors. You don't. You you want to build a product and then release it, so your competitors don't know. You have a lead time of your investment in it, um, and so you can't frequently broadcast everything from the world. Frequently what happens, people say, well, make it all open. And you go, well, you can't do that in this kind of competitive world. But the test you could use is to say, well, um, for everybody is to say, well, if you were talking to a bunch of the other people you know who are outside the industry and describing what you were doing, could you be proud of it, right? With, if the person was asking you questions, about it, say, you know, this is a good thing, I'm doing a good thing, here's why, <laughs> right? And you could use that as a test. Another test is say, say everything we were doing was printed on the front page of the New York Times or the Washington Post. Would you still say, okay, I'm sorry that was revealed because it was meant to be a competitive secret, but say, look, I, I feel proud of what I'm doing and who I am. And if you're, if you're cross-checking, not just the end product, but also the kind of the ways that you build it, the, way, the things that you're doing. And so, for example, you say, well, if you took either of those and you said, okay, well, we're, 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 we're taking the aggregate data, maybe, you know, uh, with great effort to, to, to remove personal identif identifiable information, although one of the complicated things is the larger your data set gets, the more difficult that really is to accomplish. And you say you were selling it to a hedge fund. Would you be able to do that? And the answer is no, because we're breaking our promise for our individual consumers, which is every feature that we release is better for the individual. It's, 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 it may be this much better, it may be this much better, but everything improves their experience because they're the people who are engaging, giving the data and everything else. So you have to be able to say, this is how it improves their experience. And um, if we were doing it, it's not the kind of thing, you, you would do it, you'd be hiding. And if you're ever hiding, the question is, well, why are you doing that? Right? And, and that's a good tell. Not always is it a bad thing, but you should look very carefully about why that is. Yeah, and to be clear, we, we never sold ever, yeah. we never ever sold the data. But what it also allowed us to do as you work through these hard decisions and discussions, or better better way to say it, I think, is actually the complexity of them. Yeah. Some of them are very easy because you're just like, that's not in anyone's interest. But as you work through them, you actually get a deeper insight of what you should be doing on behalf as stewards of the data. And so in this case, like when people want the data, what you say is like, yeah, people actually do want to know for an organization where people are going from this organization or going to another organization. 
And so that should be a product that is available to everybody because that's an mm -hmm. important component of trying to make an evaluation as a job seeker or just yeah. making a decision in your steps of your, your career. So let's build that in a constructive way that actually supports the individual first and then the broader, the, the broader portions of it as well as the competitive nature of being a platform that, that is a business. And, and building on the platform you built at LinkedIn give an alternative use of the overall data is LinkedIn has this project called LinkedIn Cities, mm -hmm. which is we work with various cities who are trying to figure out how to invest in essentially the future human capital in kind of what they're doing with city governance. And we're saying, here are the companies and industries that are in your town that are growing and shrinking. Here's what the job, the skills look like. Here's what the balance is. And here's the kind of things that can help you uh, kind of plan strategically to try to make your city better off. And that's another, that, that's by the way, a parallel to what the hedge fund folks were looking for. But for example, if you say, oh, look, you're using the data for this and you go to your consumers and they say, oh, it seems like a good use, mm -hmm. right? Like most people go, that's a good thing. As opposed to the, ah, we're not sure about the hedge fund thing. Right. Yeah, can I bring up another yeah. one? Yeah, sure. sure. So there, there's another one that people often miss is that, that also as you're working through some of these product decisions, trying to understand what you can do with data and why people, you should try to get people to fill out a profile in a good way to, so that you have better data, is what's the value proposition? And who are you thinking as that person that you are trying to help? And oftentimes we think of it as that we have just these abject personas and you know, we're trying to just build and just make money. We have this idea of that, well, what about people, shouldn't we be able to help people make better and smarter career decisions? And the mental model for that, which most people don't know, is this idea of, a, of developing a career explorer. And the person and the set of people that I had in mind were the people that we used to work with, were people who come out of the military, they, they're coming back home, and then the first question they ask of how to get a job is they're like, hey, friend network, I have no idea how my skills translate. And then inevitably, so one of us is like, oh, did you know you could do this or this or this? And they have no ability to, to, to browse through the wide spectrum of career choices. And so the original idea for Career Explorer was how could we use our data to help those that are coming out of the military or coming out of any place as a matter of fact. And, and, and that, is, that is something I think people miss in this, is, is that the data is only being used for one narrow slice. It's actually, you also have to look at it to actually help broad bases of people who often don't get help otherwise. So you've talked about sort of how you reason through this. You two had the benefit that you had a shared language, you had a values alignment from the beginning. Um, but there's also a time component to it, right? DJ, you've written and read, you, you have too how making good decisions takes time, mm -hmm. right? And thinking about ethics takes time. At the same time, in blitzscaling, you're talking about the need to go fast, right, mm -hmm. in conditions of uncertainty. So, and there's a lot of cognitive load in trying to reconcile those two temporal dimensions, right? Taking time for the values and speeding for the business. So how do you think about what frameworks and specific things guide you to reconcile those two competing temporal pressures? I'll go first. The, um, so part of the whole, uh, blitzscaling phenomena is that uh, individual companies actually, in fact, don't usually set the clock. The world sets the clock. The, the market sets the clock. And so uh, the speed at which you need to move as a business is, is frequently dependent upon, well, what speed are your competitors working at? And, uh, and more often than not in this networked age, the, the, we, they're what we call these Glen Gary, Glen Ross markets, which is it's a power law. So first prize, Cadillac, second prize, steak knives, third prize, you're fired. So the first, the scale really, really matters. And so the speed of that, and it's not set by you, it's like I'm just gonna choose to go really fast because if you're actually in fact uh, a business that has all the time in the world, can set it to being really efficient, you can spend less capital, you can own more, a higher percentage of the, of the business, uh, you can test a bunch of things much more easily, that's much easier to manage to. And so, Part of um, writing blitzscaling was to say, look, here's a set of techniques that we learned in Silicon Valley and why within about 30 miles of here, uh, you know, a massive uh, amount of the uh, world-changing tech companies are created. Now, part of the reason I wrote the book was also to say you can do that and you can still uh, uh, take responsibility as a core mission. And the idea was to say, to, to bring two concepts together. One is 
that as you're moving your organization, because frequently when you're blitzscaling, you're doubling the size of your employee base in a three, six, nine, 12 month cadence, which by the way leads to a lot of chaos in terms of how you manage. But as you're doing that, you're leading to a more multi-threaded organization. And one of the things you can do is add in some of those threads to saying, let's try to identify what the serious risks would be. Let's try to identify what the things we wish we fixed in advance versus fixed afterwards. Because one of the, the clear trade-offs when you're looking at this is sometimes it's better to allow the error and then fix it afterwards. And that's a Pareto better thing for the world, for the product, for winning. And sometimes you want to fix it in advance. And it depends on, on which it is. So the ones that you need to fix in advance, let's make sure we make some people that's what their job is. Their job is to identify them. Their job is to look for them. And then as a risk framework, you say, well, is there catastrophic risk to individuals? Um, you know, examples, Theranos, blood tests, other kinds of things. Um, is there a systemic risk to the overall uh, system? Like you break payments, you break the financial infrastructure, you break, and there's something that would break that. And then is there kind of like an aggregate, a very bad uh, effect over across a large number of people? And in any of those things, you try to steer in advance. You try to do the proactive things that mean that you've minimized the chances of those while you're essentially blitzscaling. And that was to, to show uh, the folks who are in these competitive races, because the competition, uh, at least on the internet, is everyone who has a server, everyone who's connected to the internet around the whole world in terms of innovation. And so that speed to scale really, in fact, matters a lot. But you can still actually do that while thinking, okay, we as the initial founding team are thinking a little bit about like what kinds of things could go wrong. And then as we scale to a multi-threaded organization, we can hire people whose job it is to say that's what I do is making sure I'm identifying those and then working with the rest of the organization on what are the ways that we don't steer into those catastrophic outcomes. Yeah, maybe let me add a very different direction from the, from the policy side it is, you know, the version of that that we took uh, in, in the Obama administration of this is how do you prototype for 1x, build for 10x, and then engineer for 100x? So you've got to start small, figure out what works. And that, that sometimes that 1x requires regulatory playgrounds, like a, a, a safe place where you're allowed to play or try different things without causing widespread chaos or catastrophe, because like they, they, you, you don't know the unintended consequences. And then how do you get a pathway to get that to 10x and then 100x? And so, you know, a lot of times we want to say, let's go slow, let's be really methodical. So let me give you the example that, that I was faced with, is uh, President Obama had announced this idea of saying, we need, a, we need to really go after disease in a new massive way. And that is, to first requires the collection of data on a, in a scale that has never been seen before. And this is a precision medicine initiative, so let's collect data from a million people at the genomic level as well as medical records. And then also followed by Vice President Biden's uh, son dying and, uh, from cancer, from geoblastoma, and saying we need to go full on in, on a cancer moonshot. And in that case, one of the things that people miss about data and healthcare data is if you talk to people who are chronically ill or, or, uh, or have a, such a serious time constraint, they're just saying, go, go, go. They, they don't care where the data is posted. They need the data. They're, they're, gonna, they're willing to put it on top in any public profile that they can. And they just want it, that data to be used effectively. So we need to go at maximum warp speed to help those people. We also need to figure out how to have the safeguards simultaneously to make sure that broad-based harm doesn't happen or um, ethical violations happen that, that we've seen historically in the biomedical space, like from Henrietta Lacks to Tuskegee to other things. And so how do you balance those? And what you realize is the way to do that is to start with a small contained environment to figure out what is working. And so we have those, those data sets there, protected, increasing the layers, looking at how people use it, then adding more layers and more sophistication. And then finally, now the full-blown program that is rolling out. But I think there's an important thing to add here, because the medical and genetics research you know, for cancer and everything else uh, gives a very good lens of where there is an amazingly important thing, because you can potentially save lives years and decades earlier. And that is a really right. huge thing. 
And then you've got a set of things around you know, HIPAA and, and, and medical data and ethics compliance. And the problem that people frequently use when they use the word ethics is they try to have a 0% chance of a bad outcome. And a 0% chance of a bad outcome of any bad outcome means that you're going to do almost nothing or you're going to move at a super slow speed. And at that point, lots of people in this case, for example, are going to die from cancer that you otherwise could have solved. And so actually, in fact, the details of an ethics conversation are not like kind of like a, a deontological like 10 commandments, thou shalt and thou shalt not. It's being able to do the trade-offs of what the risks are and the, and the negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it isn't you try to avoid every negative outcome, you try to avoid the really bad negative outcomes. And it isn't that you try to go, I have 0% chance, I try to make it a very low chance and then be able to correct. And that's the framework in which you need to think about kind of ethical decisions when it gets to this. When you have significant things where the, the, the prize, you know, being able to cure certain cancers earlier is huge in a worldwide, you know, kind of um, the health and betterment of society. That's, that's extremely well said. And one of the things that we've seen is we, we hear all these amazing studies that sort of just turn our reality upside down, like the Raj Chetty research about showing if you take a child and move them in their early teens from a high poverty to low poverty area. Those, that, those data sets are extraordinarily sensitive. And what was done in all those cases is a combination of strong safeguards combined with legal provisions around making sure that that data is protected and that you know, if something happens, it's really tightly contained. And, and if, if we had gone to the efforts where we said there's zero probability of, of something possibly going somewhat wrong, that we would never discover, like that research would not take place. That data would stay locked up on servers and no one would ever benefit. So you talked about one end of the spectrum. If you don't have any risk, you have no reward. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the other end of the spectrum and AI applications in particular. Mm -hmm. Are there any AI applications that make you uncomfortable? And if there are, what are they? Well, how long do we have? <laughs> Pick your favorite. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, for me, many of them have been covered t today. You know, if I, if I had the, the, the top set that is, that is uh, uh, the problems that are ahead of us, the biggest one is people actually label, labeling something AI or data science when it's really not anything inside the box, if you will. It's just a bunch of heuristics. Uh, we've seen this around bail calculators and other things that directly implement imp impact uh, places. The other place I think is there is that we have a massive population that is being educated around how to use these technologies today and we're not training them or equipping them with the language or the ability to have the discussions or the forums to, to discuss are these things acceptable or not. And, and that's where I get the most nervous versus just the direct today problem? I think that it's less a specific technology and more two patterns where I pay a lot of attention and concern. So one is misuse, right? So for example, already uh, this morning and, um, and Etchemendi asked this question because I also think that saying facial recognition, just bad, you shouldn't do it, is a mistake, right? I can think of lots of places where You'd say, well, actually, in fact, facial recognition is a really good thing. You'd say, well, um, we're trying to track down a bioterrorist and you know, through airports, it can actually be a really good thing if you're trying to stop a 12 monkeys scenario, as an example. I mean, there's just tons of places. Um, you know, we already actually all have, bad, well, you know, a bunch of us who work at large corporations have these badges that get you indoors or not. And, you know, like, well, if you have a badge getting you in a door, facial recognition for getting you in a door is a perfectly good uh, way of doing it. So there's a set of things that could actually, in fact, uh, work out very well. Now, it can be misused. If it's misused is part of, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, kind of creating a, uh, autocratic surveillance state. Well, that's <laughs> that. That's a serious problem. Now, unfortunately, we're uh, because this is going to be developed and is being developed at greater speed in China already today. <laughs> right? I don't think that's something we can uh, we can uh, stop or slow down here. But how it's used is the big question on most of these things. And then the second thing, which DJ already gestured at, but I think is worth re-emphasizing, is that. Um, 
what we need, and this is part of the reason why uh, you know um, John and Fei Fei were doing such a good thing of putting this together with the whole crew, and part of what why it's imperative that HAI exist, is there's a set of questions that get to the okay, what are the questions when we're looking at a data set that have to be asked, right, to make sure because. The thing about AI is it's not necessarily so scary that it gives you know, me or DJ a bad credit score. Right? That's not the, the individual, but all of a sudden it becomes the entire society. So if you have uh, racial bias, you know, other kinds of biases that you're institutionalizing, you're locking them in in a much more serious way that's scalable, potentially not trackable, et cetera. So the, 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 the humanist questions the ethics questions about saying, all right, how, which questions do we need to ask when we're uh, building features on these data sets? And then which questions need to have been asked in order for us to have a sense of, of, of um, belief that we're moving in the right direction towards having more justice in society, right? For, you know, kind of diverse groups and everything else. And that can range from credit, which is one that I focus on a lot, also parole recommendations of which um, Julie Angwin has done a lot of good work on and, and these kind of things as a way of, of, of trying to say, okay, which are the questions that when I'm an engineer working in a company, I go, oh, I gotta make sure I ask those questions before we you know, we're actually begin uh, saying this product is even remotely ready for market. There's also a big part of this I think that is really important for us to remember when we focus on the algorithm is that there actually just aren't that many data sets. Mm -hmm. you know, like, so we, like one of the problems that, that I think we really need to spend a lot of time focusing on is our criminal justice system. We have an endless cycle of incarceration. We have you know, more than 10 million people a year cycling through 3,100 jails. You know, they stay there on average 23 days. 95% never go on to prison. I mean, this is, and there's incredible follow-on effects that are, that are horrific for, for the, the local communities. And in that, there, one of the fundamental things is, is how well does Palo Alto Police Department compare and their stop rates of an individual and a search rate on those individuals based on ethnicity? How does that compare to San Francisco PD, to San Jose PD, Memphis PD, Austin, Dallas PD? Pick all your places. This data doesn't exist. The places where the data exists, it's often locked up in a way that no one can access it. And so we almost have this Maslow's hierarchy of, of trying to work on things that we have first need that data to actually be opened up. We have a crisis going on right now around organ donations. We have people who are, are dying and they want to be organ donors and then the people who are responsible for actually ensuring that those organs are donated do not show up. They do not do their job. We as taxpayers pay them money to do this job, to donate kidneys, corneas, all sorts of things to help another life. And as a result, those organs age out and they cannot be used. You could save easily 14,000 lives a year just with the bare minimum. This isn't even living donors of like kidney, like me donating a kidney to a friend. And why don't we do better here? There is no measurement that is done. There's no one actually looking at the time intervals or any of these pieces that, that are there. Eric was mentioning this this morning. Like, there's so many pieces of the economy that we don't have visibility into. And so if we made that data available and we have the ability to do proxy measures now, the data is horrifying. It, it is absolutely outrageous what's there. And so a lot of times we focus on like, all the cool stuff AI could do to help get those organ, uh, organs moved faster. And that would be awesome. I don't want to take that away from anybody. But I first want to actually make sure the base level things that are supposed to happen in organ donation actually take place. And that's just opening up data and making it available and having good oversight of somebody who looks at the data. So one of the things, I'm glad you mentioned this, DJ, that came out this morning was how little data we have in critical issues, and organ donation being one of them. But at the same time, we have too much data, right? And making sense of the world requires AI to help us deal with the, just the overload of information that we have. So we have both problems simultaneously. I wanna pivot a little bit and pick up on something, Reed, that you said, you mentioned China. Hmm. Let's talk about China. So, so far we've talked about the competitive environment in the market, but we're also involved in a competitive environment geopolitically. 
So on the one hand, I know that, that Reed, you've talked about how AI is like electricity, and there are real benefits to making it widely available. And so that's a sort of positive sum view of the world, right? We all benefit by making this more widely available. But we see from the policy world and from other corners that there is more of a zero sum view of the world, right? That we're actually at the same time in a competitive environment with China, and whoever gets the AI applications fastest wins, the Glengarry Glen, Ro Glen mm. Ross. Are we in Glengarry Glen Ross with respect to competition in AI with China? How do you reconcile these two perspectives of where we are with US China relations? So I think the short answer is both, right? People tend to say pick one or the other. So on the question of is it uh, better to be uh, kind of collaborating, sharing, et cetera, the answer is yes. Uh, you're in dialogues about, for example, what does AI safety look like? Uh, and the parallels go back to the nuclear scientists were still talking to each other back when we were kind of trying to figure out uh, treaties and so forth. And it's good to have these kind of conversations. It's good to have a flow of discussion about uh, ethics and, um, and kind of what, what are good products, what are not good products. I'm also a uh, believer in the fact that the more that we have um, both economic and cultural exchange, uh, the more stable the world is. So that is generally a good thing. Now that being said, uh, you're also in a race to say, you're, you're in at least two kinds of races. One kind of race is a, an economics race, like who's defining the, the, um, uh, the kind of the uh, technologies of the future. And for example, one of the perspectives that's frequently held in China is say, well, look, we're trying to race towards AI because we know that the manufacturing jobs of the future are in AI-enabled factories. And we're going to get there first. And so then we're going to continue to, to maintain a manufacturing dominance. Well, if we'd like to have a manufacturing industry uh, in this country or in any country, it's like, well, that's a good perspective to say uh, businesses compete, they race, they try to get there. You want to get there you know, in, in, in time to have healthy industries and everything else. The second part of it is also uh, kind of the geopolitical concerns, which is cyber weapons. Or, for example, if you say, well, uh, what we're going to be doing is using AI uh, to monitor minority groups and whether or not we give them, you know, kind of uh, uh, travel passes and other things else like the Uyghurs in, in China. Well, you say, well, you also have to be ahead of that technology. You're embedding the questions of which things are in the, in the platform standard. Are you capable as a country in navigating that space? It's really important. Because uh, some conflicts between nations are non-zero sum in trade, and some are zero sum. And you have to be present on both of them, right? And so um, the frustration that I find with folks who say uh, uh, we're just an all out I'm like, for example, most people don't realize if China goes in recession, the world goes in recession. They say, we're in this all-out conflict. She's like, well, that's a, <laughs> that's a terrible thing. And that it's bad for us, too. Um, and then, but then also, if you say, well, but we do have some questions about, well, do we think democracy or do we think autocracy should be the way that the general world order runs? There's areas of conflict there. And so you want to essentially be playing, I think, on the side of democracy in that conflict. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, the, one of the things that I, I, would, I would just encourage us to also really look at, and, and Reed and I participated in a, a Council of Foreign Relations Task Force report that really kind of talk, thinks about what's the national security assessment need to look at, uh, look like for, for us as a country. And, and you know, China obviously is, is a major component of this. But I think the real major component is actually us looking at ourselves as a country also. You know, we, we have dropped our investment in sciences. We don't have the, you know, the kind of the, 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 the overall imperative from a national perspective of major research efforts that, that, that we used to. And so when we say, hey, China's accelerating, we're also saying like, look, we're decelerating our investments as well. And, and so, and you can just see that on, on GDP, if you look at the percentage of GDP invested. So one of the ways- You mean by the U.S. By government? The US, just by the U.S. Clear, government. Yeah. The U.S. government yeah. in investing compared to the Chinese government. And I think it's also very important that we separate these as these are governments when the, versus people. Uh, it's a very important component as well. And so, for example, when President Obama announced the Precision Medicine Initiative, you know, the rough investment, I think, was something in the order of $25 million. And about a few weeks later, China followed on uh, with their investment of $1 billion. 
<laughs> and we said, wow, that's a, that's a pretty solid anti in. Uh, and so finally, we got the Congress to move the investment up to roughly 700 million. Now, why can't, if this is such an imperative, why, why are we not investing more aggressively? Why aren't we actually taking the leadership role that we know can happen because we have the leading institutions? Why aren't we training more people? And so I think it's, it's just, a, I just wanna draw out that dimension because we leave it out that, that this is our race to also lose and that we're not investing as we need to as a country. So picking up on what you, Thank you. <laughs> It's okay to applaud. <laughs> so picking up on, on that point about the, the, tra the talent piece. So we've talked a lot about companies, we've talked about machines, but this is about people too. Mm -hmm. And you both have been instrumental in these dialogues, CFR and other efforts mm -hmm. to try to bridge the suit hoodie divide, <laughs> right? So in your experience, there's a lot of people that are here at this conference that are engaged in that effort too. In your experience, what are, what are the most important misperceptions that each side has of the other that you're working to overcome? Between the suits and the hoodies? Between the <laughs> folks in Washington, who are, who are the suits, and the hoodies out in Silicon Valley, who are in the private sector and the innovation space. So um, the, the thing that I most often wish happens more in the dialogue is is almost like a joint, uh, when you're getting together and designing something, you throw a bunch of design criteria together, and then you begin to reason through the design criteria. And what happens, I think, frequently is that, the, um, that, that each side looks at only its design criteria and doesn't include the design criteria from the other side, and then doesn't reason about it. And I think that's the most often what leads to these miscomprehensions, because, um, you know, like, take, for example, uh, encryption. In, 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 in mobile phones. And so, for example, frequently the DC side shows up and says, well, actually, in fact, we need to have keys to this encryption because we need to be able to track it and we need to do stuff, and that's central for us doing our jobs. And, when they, and what they hear when they hear the other side saying that's a terrible idea is they say, well, that, they hear the other side saying that's bad for my business because they hear the other side saying, what I care about is I have all this encryption uh, because then I'll be able to sell more of my products. And actually, in fact, frequently what's happening in that dialogue on the other side is to say, well, there really isn't an easy way to give out keys to, to, without making the whole system a lot less secure. And actually having a radically insecure system is actually really bad right, as a way of doing it. But then because the design criteria is not shared, it's not saying, well, look, OK, I get it. You need to have and then encryption on a variety of things in order to have an overall secured system, in order to have e uh, commerce online, in order to be able to have privacy for people talking to each other and a bunch of other things that are virtuous. How do I solve my tracking down criminal behavior problem? So help me with that, <laughs> right? And give me some options for what I can do there so that we can also do that because that's also important in society. And that's an example of where the two sides, like one saying, okay, you just don't understand the technology is the hoodie side. Because if you actually, in fact, said, well, I had a master key, or I had, like, one of the ones I was pitched on was, well, we have three different master oh, keys, yeah. and they all have to come together. And you're like, that's still a master key. It's a problem, <laughs> right? you know, from a technology standpoint. And then um, on I'll the- I'll never get those hours back. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Flashbacks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. And then, um, and so, and that goes down to a, to a, uh, to a significant number of different issues for what's the, the, the understanding and misunderstanding of what the suicides are. And it's not to say that the technology companies aren't focused on how do they, of course, generate profits and have a really good business. That's part of the motive. That motive is there. Um, but it isn't the only motive that's there. There's other motives that are there as well. On the other hand, of course, part of what, like, for example, I wrote in Blitzscaling, is that the interesting thing when you're moving from these sizes, you start as a startup and you're doing these kind of experiments and kind of radical things where when you fail is not a very big deal you start growing but eventually you become such a size that you're like infrastructure and now you have to have society as your customer too and how do we have society as your customer how do we address the issues that are it's not just what does an individual want and succeed because that's by the way how most of the tech companies say well we're measured by whether or not people use us or not whether whether or not people like us or not and you're like well that's a good measure right but like that's, by the way, a very democratic measure. It's like, you know, what is our NPS score? How many people use us? 
but you also have to say, we don't just govern our society by what a bunch of individuals want, but also by collective social mechanisms. How do we bring those collective social mechanisms in a way that, that has the benefit of both or, or trades off and against the virtues in the right way? Yeah, the, the part of that I would just emphasize to people is that government is who shows up. And when technologists don't show up, you know, you're going to get poor policy decisions. And, and you know, one of the ones that I think, uh, I think Jim Comey made a massive error on was we had really pushed Jim to make sure that he had technologists on his team as he was thinking about some of these decisions especially on encryption, and we said, look, you, if you don't have people that you can trust who are on your team and who are working with you all at every step along the way, you're not going to see why adding a third key or a fourth key is no different than having a master key. Like, it's just, it's like t keys all the way down, right? And, <laughs> and that, that, that was an unfortunate miss of his leadership. Yeah. I think there's areas where we've seen very strong benefits, right? We saw Ash Carter, who put a set of technologists into his team around the Defense Innovation Unit uh, out here in Silicon Valley, but also the Defense Digital Service. And that has led to massive step function improvements in the way we think about a set of problems, as well as also seeing how people can work more collaboratively together. I think there's a few other things that are also in there that we have to start thinking about in, in this of the divide, especially around uh, uh, national security items. And that is, and, and you've been leading this with the fellowship program, is that most people who work in Silicon Valley will not ever meet somebody who's in the armed services. And that's just a function of our demographics and where people, military bases are. And I think that's, that's sad because those are the people who are actually putting their lives on the line every day so that we can be here. And they well, don't see what's happening. And the other thing I would add as a plus one to that is, um, you know, serving on the uh, Department of Defense Innovation Board along with Eric Schmidt, um, the actual function that the DOD is trying to drive towards is how do you keep peace? So if you say, what I'm doing is I'm opting out to not helping you, <laughs> right? Not only are you endangering people who are putting their lives on the line, not only are you not doing your duty as a citizen, but also you're, you're undercounting a func the actual function, which is how do we keep peace? Right. One, one thing I wish people could see is how crappy some of the tech is. Like, I, I mean, it is so bad. And yeah. that, like, you look at this and you're like, that's how we run things? <laughs> And, and what, you would, what you need is you realize, like, wow, worse decisions get made because of how terrible the technology is. And so actually more harm can happen. And so you need, you need this better bridging of the worlds to actually make this happen. And, and we often forget, and I think it was Ash Carter who said this here, uh, mm -hmm. I believe on this stage uh, 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 a number of years ago, where, you know, the Department of Defense and the U.S. federal government is a spark. It, it, it's, it's a spark. Silicon Valley and the rest of the system really is what makes the flame come alive. No better example than that of autonomous vehicles and the DARPA Grand Challenge. And then also the race to decode the human genome led by Francis Collins at the National Institutes of Health. And look at how much has happened. But we, we need that cycle to get better. And the, 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 I am convinced the best way to have that is when we show up. And, and so it's very easy to say, sorry, I don't work on that, or I don't do, on that, do that. Well, if you have a disagreement about it or the policy, jump all in. Jump all in there and be that voice at the table and help steer the conversation to a better place. But approach the problem with humility of why those decisions got there. Because oftentimes you can't see all the difficult things that led to that, 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 that point. Actually, the autonomous vehicle one brings up a more concrete example back to the China question, mm -hmm. which is the current stance of the U.S. government is to say, well, uh, the U.S. is leading an autonomous vehicle technology. Let's deny it to China. Right? Let's make sure it doesn't go there. And the general uh, definition is because, well, you have autonomous tanks, right, or kind of equivalent. Because once you have an autonomous vehicle, you can have an autonomous tank. And you say, well, okay, so what, do, what, is this, the, what does this uh, decision mean? Well, the decision means that uh, as opposed to, like, what are all the different issues that go into safety with AV? There's no dialogue between them. 
China is well on its way to developing its own autonomous vehicle technology, so as opposed to having interoperability and everything else. And then when you get to the entire rest of the world, as opposed to taking where the US currently has a, a technological advantage going down the autonomous vehicle path, it's saying that uh, actually, in fact, we're now going to have a different competing platform uh, as opposed to being able to capitalize on that lead, which will affect US industry, US jobs, uh, and matter of fact, even maybe US national security. And that's an example of where engagement is actually, in fact, I think better. We're, we're so myopic right now on certain sets of these problems. It's unbelievable. And, and like, we have species problems that are ahead of us, right? We have climate change. We have the potential for pandemics. We have all these slew of issues. Cancer doesn't care what geographic boundary you're in. And so what we need is actually better international frameworks. We need a treaty mechanism where how are we going to actually share genomic data across regional lines so that we can actually work on a human problem. And what, is a, what do the rights look like for economic development and all that? That's, that's important on top of it. But we, we, so many of these problems I see is like, they're irrelevant from the perspective of, of just this, this, this um, short-sighted two, three-year arc that, that we're in right now. So that's a great segue into let's move beyond the short-sighted two, three-year arc. So let's imagine that we've all convened here 25 years from now. And we're looking back and were we right or were we wrong? Tell us or share with us your thoughts on what do you think looking back 25 years from now were the greatest breakthroughs in AI for the world? What was the worst surprise bad outcome? And what's the most important norm that was created? So biggest positive outcome, biggest surprise bad outcome, most important norm. If you're looking back 25 years from now. Want me to go first? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I was hoping you were gonna say no. Uh, so, I'd say biggest negative surprise is, and it almost goes back to some of the things where uh, it's so important that Silicon Valley actually engages with the DoD and so forth. Um, uh, I think that one of the classic problems with AI when it's, uh, it's tied to cyber um, cyberspace, you know, um, is that the action, in fact, it's, it's much more of an offensive weapon than a defensive weapon, an offensive defensive weapon theory, which means you need to go develop it and figure out the antidotes quickly. And if you would actually don't do that, if you lag behind doing that, the likelihood that something bad happens as an outcome is, I think, very high, because I think bad actors won't lag behind it, won't, wor won't worry about it. So I think you need to understand its potential for how it works as a offensive weapon so that you can start working on what are the ways that you actually, in fact, uh, you deal with a secure cyberspace and deal with attacks and so forth? And, and I think that the tech industry's general uh, trying to kind of go with the sentiment of its employees and saying, we're not going to do very much on this, I think will actually, in fact, could create what might be a disastrous effect in 25 years. And you can see little elements of it already, like, um, you know, the wanna cry and other kinds of viruses, and you say, well, what happens if one of those things happened? You know, doesn't that require a major state actor like Russia or something else? But what happens if, if, it, if it actually, in fact, gets unleashed by even a relatively small actor and we're not really ready for it? And that's something I could see being a, a complete disaster. Um, on, the, uh, on the optimistic side, I think that, you know, part of the question about how we solve a number of key issues. Medical, uh, certainly everything from precision medicine. Um, you know, like for example, I think, um, you know, once we begin to get a, a more in-depth understanding of genetics, we can take a look at a whole stack of drugs that have failed FDA approval. And then we might be able to realize that, I mean, like talk about a, a like yeah. tree, like fruit on the ground. Off-label use yes. is just <laughs> ripe for. Yes. Right, and you say, oh, just not this genetics, and it works for all the other genetics. Then all of a sudden, the number of medical solutions goes way up um, because it's, it's off-label, it's cheap, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do, like just amazing uh, uh, medical side. And I think that the, uh, the norms that will get established, I think, will be less around the dialogues that happen today 
around, well, does it, is it all come down to an individual owning their data or certain kind of privacy rights and much more around data use, right? And the question of what are you using it for and in what kind of uses and uh, who else are you accountable to? Like which, which, which agencies do you say, here I'm revealing my uses to you so you can, you can monitor in case I'm doing something bad? Not stop, not ask for permission per se, when I mean, you could stop if I'm doing something bad, but not saying, oh, come to a year you know, proving it, but like say, here's what we're doing, so I'm on top of it, I, I see it. And I think that will happen much more within the, the norms within the data space. Yeah, I, I agree with those. Let me just try to take it in a slightly different direction. So the, the thing that goes wrong uh, is asymmetric actors. Uh, and I think we've seen this historically from everything from uh, terrorist hijacking of planes, you know, a la 1970s, then 9-11, uh, uh, and then IEDs, uh, and now drones. And I think the version we see of this is a massive cyber attack. Uh, that does very, very large-scale destructive uh, uh, widespread action, and it will be uh, some form of AI machine learning based. Uh, the, the thing that I think I, we lo look back and I would love to be surprised by in, in 25 years, I think we're actually underestimating the impact AI machine learning will have on the basic sciences, and particularly mathematical mm -hmm. physics. I think we're seeing very surprising results in the calculation of equations that we understand really well that are typically in the realm of chaotic systems or highly nonlinear systems, uh, places where we have really complicated, for those that are mathematicians, like where we have these really weird manifold systems and then we're approaching that with a, the space of quantum and how do we think about the mathematical physics. And I think AI is going to help us approach and see different ways of looking at these problems that we hadn't fully appreciated. And that will have long-term effects in, if you think about communication and computing. The norm that I think, we, that, that I think we, we realize is that we, as part of our curriculum, we have the liberal arts inserted back more aggressively into our curriculum because we have lost something that is that grounds us as we think about technology going forward. And we saw that in the medicine, medical field as the introduction of bioethics. And I think we find that, that and I'm not saying we just need bioethics, like the same cut and paste into to, to this space. We find our own version of what, what does it take to ground us and bring humanity into these problems? And what does that curriculum look like? And how do we, how do we get bigger than just a set of problems that are very specific towards a, uh, a, a very s select set of N applications. Let me do an amplification because uh, you put the AI on, on kind of physics knowledge generation. Mm -hmm. I think it's all knowledge generation. Yeah, yeah. And let me use a, what might be a surprising yeah. example, which is you say, what would AI have to do with someone who is working in poetry right. Right, in an academic institution? You say, well, actually, in fact, if you're doing an analysis, you say, well, which other poems have been written that have a similar kind of structure or image structure and being able to, to bring those to bear when you're looking at it, uh, being able to do uh, different uh, interesting forms of dynamic generation, like what if, what if a poem was not something that was just static that you kind of like write once, but actually in fact ha had actually a dynamism to it because you're using essentially AI as an under, uh, underpinning on how you write it. Like, and this is kind of, that's on one far extreme. And I think it goes the entire way. It's very easy when you get to history. It's very easy when you get to political science. You say, well, we actually, in fact, have massive amounts of data sets where uh, the ability to see patterns, the ability to um, actually develop those patterns will be central to what is professional competence and knowing whether or not we have truth or not. And when you get to all science, uh, hopefully we'll get to a point where we are uh, speaking of data, we're putting all scientific results into a database, including all the negative results, and then you, then you can actually be running AI across that, and the acceleration of science should be pretty impressive in that case. Yeah. Well said. Wow. Well, on that broad note, let's open it up. We have time for a couple of questions from the audience, so raise your hand, and we should have roaming microphones so people can hear us. I see uh, over here on the side, there's a microphone coming right up now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm curious to get your, your opinion um, on kind of the question around uh, policy making and public policy in technology and whether is the problem is kind of that policymakers just don't really think their constituents care very much. 
about how they regulate technology. Um, I mean, when you ask, you know, you look at polls of what are voters' main concerns, it's the economy, it's healthcare, et cetera. Um, and then you see, you know, uh, candidates like Elizabeth Warren going after Facebook, but at the same time, it's very hard to imagine, you know, a pitchfork-wielding mob showing up at Facebook's headquarters. I mean, how do you kind of bring that discussion to the grassroots voters to make them actually care about how policymakers are regulating policy um, and therefore pot potentially, you know, um, making better policy around technology? I'll, I'll throw out a couple things. So the first is, is uh, we need technologists on campaigns. Y you got to have a technologist on a campaign to help shepherd that, those platforms and those ideas. President Obama partly had some of those people early on, and that's why there was a role of the U.S. Chief Technology Officer that was first created. Uh, that was part of, the, uh, part of the actual campaign. As to the actual getting uh, people to care about it in, the, in the, the nuanced form, I think one of the things that we have, to, we have to start asking is how do we have the richer conversations? Right now, it's, and we've seen this in the hearings, like some of the questions that are asked, we kind of look at them and we're like, wow, is that really the right question to ask or who's staffing that? One of the things that concretely Congress needs to bring back is that was removed during uh, when uh, Newt Gingrich and, uh, and the, uh, the, the broad-based um, shift in Congress happened was getting rid of the Office of Technology Assessment, which was Congress's way of actually having technologists and scientists add value. Uh, that needs to be brought back. And then the other one which is, is there is when we think about these things, we have to actually, like I'll, I'll give you the example that's extremely frustrating to me. We've had data breach after data breach after data breach. We've all got credit score reporting like probably like five times over. Uh, we all know our medical records are out there. Uh, for those of us that worked in the federal government, our security applications, our SF-86s have been exposed, which is extraordinarily sensitive information, uh, not just of ourselves, but of our family members. And yet we also have data that's being sold all the time by data brokers. The FTC has proposed what regulation should have happen. And despite all this, the Congress is not doing anything about it. Yet there is very little public pressure to actually do anything on, on those fronts. Part of that is us, we've also taken away the, to, to the journalists that are out there. We need much more we need more attention on these things. It's, we've given a pass on the data brokers. We've very, been very focused only on one side of the problem, your medical data being sold. So how do we get that side that we've kind of just given up on? And we're looking towards the next set of things. We need to look at all of those things together. And I think that's going to take, that's a, that's a we moment. That's not just a single pockets of activism. That's a collective all of us have to decide to pull together and advocate. To, to different mechanisms. And it's not just any single one. It's calling your Congress people. It's being showing up for the government. It's talking to people. It's writing amicus briefs for, for those on the judiciary side. And then finally, it's us having dialogues like these forums. This is critical in making sure the voices that aren't here f have the ability to get here. And we make it a safe space where all voices are actually have the ability to voice up, whether we agree or disagree with them. So two obvious things that I would add. One um, is that voters don't really care that much about the how, they care about the what, right? And so you have to, you have to bridge the how. Like this is the way that technology decisions have an impact on you, right? This is how it has an impact on your healthcare, this is how it has an impact on your job, right? These are things, and so th those bridges are really important. And that gets down to why we do events like the one today, why HAI exists, is trying to figure out how to package it in that way that people can then understand it as it relates to their life. And that's part of the human-centered AI, uh, the human-centered part of it. I'd just add one other thing, just from Stanford's mm -hmm. perspective, that there's a role for universities to play, and HAI is doing this, which is educating policymakers, yeah. bringing people Great. together so that if voters aren't taking the pitchforks to wherever they need to go, to the halls of Congress, members of Congress, their staffs, members of the judiciary are actually learning and have networks of people they can reach back to better understand what are these technologies, how do we think about the values trade-offs, and how can we make more thoughtful policy? So that's a really important role for HAI and Stanford to play, and it's one of the exciting things, I think, that this new institute is doing. So we have time for one or two more questions. So hand right here. Yes, sir. Wait for the, if you can wait for the mic, it's coming. Uh, 
Are you worried that... I'm it, always worried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's easy. Worried. <laughs> Are you worried that AI can drive higher inequality mm -hmm. around the world, between countries, and of course, between citizens in each country? And if it's yes, and I think it's yes, how do you think we can prevent it? So uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, uh, just like any kind of powerful technology, it could be the kind of thing where you say, well, OK, um, all productivity goes to robots, and only a few people own the robots, as an example of, of something that would do that. Um, and uh, there's various ways that you try to offset this. So, um, uh, you know, two, one uh, is kind of the question of, all right, so what are the parts that need to be um, kind of open source, more domain? How do you, how do, what are those things? How do you make them happen? It's part of the research agenda that's here at, at HAI uh, for that. And then also um, there's even, you know, other organizations like OpenAI that say, well, we're, we're building these technologies with an end, you know, and we're trying to be AI safety and all the rest, with an end towards now we can distribute this, you know, kind of to many industries and around the world for that so that it isn't just in the hands of the few, right? Those are two of many, many efforts. I do think that the question of, of, of how do we navigate that inequality is important um, and you need, to be, you need to be asking it every month and every, every year. Um, I worry sometimes that the asking question says, okay, well, uh, slow down. And the problem is you say, well, the people who say, well, I have a worry, so I'm going to slow down, and the people who don't have the worry don't slow down, then you have a bad outcome. So I tend to say, like, ethics is where you drive to not necessarily always hitting the brakes, right, in terms of, in terms of how you look at this. And that's actually an important way of uh, uh, asterisk on that answer. I, I would just reinforce one of the parts is that the underlying data sets already are problematic. Precision medicine is already here if you're a middle-aged white male with insurance that lives right yep. next to Stanford. Yeah. If you live across the freeway, you don't get it if you're in East Palo Alto. And, and, like, there's, and also, by the way, the women aren't in these data sets. Why aren't, why aren't they? Because who advocates for health care for an individual who's sick? It's oftentimes uh, a woman who's advocating on behalf of, of a male. And you have to have the insurance, you have to have the large scale research institutes and all those things. So there's a fundamental bias in those systems. There's also a racial prejudice that is historic. And there's, because of the, the bias that's been in there, there is a fear of pop, uh, in certain parts of the U United States of being able to participate in those data sets because of the fear that the data is gonna be used against them. And there is good historical precedent for that. And so we have to approach those problems also with that understanding that is going to limit also the, or, or, or exacerbate the, the, the inequity that, that happens in the, in the use of these algorithms and other technologies. And so th that's one of the core sets that I, I think has to happen is that we have to, go, we have to take that and not just focus at where a AI is happening. We have to kind of go all the way back to, to some of these different pieces. Yes, right here in front. If you can hang on one second and we'll see our microphone right folks are getting a workout. Uh, <laughs> right here in the front. Coming to your middle. right. Coming, coming, coming. Uh, thank you for such wonderful insights. You're inspiring a lot of people to take charge. Um, I have a question about, uh, uh, you know, prototyping smart, si smart, sustainable, and circular cities. Uh, can we do that one city at a time? Or are there spaces which are not uh, habitable? For example, outskirts, you know, there's so much crowd in the Bay Area, like outskirts, you know, where people don't live that much, they don't want to commute all the way to the, the, you know, the big companies. Can we make those areas like smart city experiments? When I say smart city, I mean uh, the autonomous cars have autonomous lanes. We don't have to spend money on, you mm. know, the computer vision or, you know, the, the ethical decision making, an autonomous car will go in an autonomous lane and there'll be a hyperloop and we're not stuck in traffic. You know. Well, I, I'm always a fan of sp spending some money on ethical decision making. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I do actually think that one of the things that we don't do enough of in this country is uh, learning from where other great things happen outside, including uh, China's use of special economic zones. So for example, you say, well, let's try to say, 
this city, we're gonna, we're gonna go faster on autonomous vehicles because we think it's really gonna help us, right? And, and, and that should happen more of, right? We should say, all right, well, what are, what are areas where we can experiment with, uh, you might even say some precision medicine things or some kind of data regimes, or if we're gonna say, okay, um, we're willing to say we're gonna put cameras up like uh, London has everywhere and we're gonna, we're gonna see what that leads to in terms of public security. I think those kinds of abilities to run the experiments in cities is actually extremely good. And so uh, I think we should do a lot more of it and we don't seem to do very much of it. Yeah, the thing I would just add is every city is an experiment in, in some way. And then what's the incentive? There's something called the opportunity Opportunity Zones, which gives a framework for actually different types of investment. The Obama administration had a number of uh, efforts around trying to provide federal dollars to accelerate uh, uh, particular cities and counties to actually take charge and implement more of this. One of the things that is missed is that we don't have the forums where you get to share across. And I'll give you a concrete one that's not gone as well as I would like is body cameras. Uh, for policing. So the idea was provide dollars around body cameras. Unfortunately, there was not a thought, lot of thought put into where is that data going to be stored, what are the costs incurred, what are the policies for review, all of those different things. And because there wasn't a great mechanism to share, what happened is, as a result, the, the, it went to the lowest common denominator of the of decisions that do not benefit the public. It disproportionately benefits the officers and the, uh, driven largely by the police unions. And what I would rather have seen is that we had to discuss those things and then suddenly we would say, hey, this is a heck of a lot better if we all decide we want the, the shining light on the hill. And, and that requires open public forums for people to also to discuss what's gone well and not what's not gone well without the pitchforks just coming out and, and just bashing them because otherwise they'll never share again around these sensitive items. So we have come to the end of our time. Uh, please thank me and join me in thanking DJ and Reed for sharing.